All right. Well, hello and good morning, everyone, and happy World Ocean Day from California State Parks. My name is Erica Delamar. I am the Marine Protected Area Outreach and Education Project Coordinator for California State Parks, and I'm here in Point Lobos State Natural Reserve, uh, just near Monterey, California, on the central coast of California. We are so excited to share with you the program that we've put together for you today in celebration of World Ocean Day. To give a little bit of context for what we're going to be doing, um, the, the World Ocean Day uh, conservation focus for 2022 is uh, the 30 by 30 initiative. So that is the global initiative to protect 30% of our lands, our waterways, and our global ocean by the year 2030. So that's a really big effort and California is working on it as well as many other states and nations around the world to really ensure that we have really solid and healthy ecosystems to support global populations into the future. Now here in California, we have 280 state parks um, spread out across the state. A lot of them along the California coast where I am now, many of them inland as well, north and south, everywhere in between. In addition to those 280 state parks, we have nine national parks in California. So that's a lot of the protection we have on land. Now here along the California coast, we have 124 California marine protected areas or what we call MPAs. And they are essentially protected areas. I'm standing here right in front of one, right along the California coast. So a network of 124 of them. And then additionally, we have four national marine sanctuaries. So on land and in the water, we have those state protections and then those federal protections. Now, why are we talking about the land? This is World Ocean Day, right? Well, what it's all about here is we are going to help you today to understand and explore your connection with the global ocean. So you may not live along the California coast. You may be far from it. You may be 50 miles inland, 500 miles inland. You may only see the ocean once every few years on vacation, or maybe you've never been to the ocean before at all. But did you know that your life is inter intricately connected to the global ocean? Take a deep breath with me really quick. And another one. Every other breath you take, you can say, thank you, ocean because the ocean is responsible for more than 50% of the oxygen that is in our atmosphere today. So today we're gonna explore how our life inland is connected to healthy ocean ecosystems, but also how our activities and our choices that we make inland and along the coast can have impacts on the ocean, whether they are positive or negative, that's a choice that we get to make. Now, we're gonna go ahead and kick it off. I do want to introduce someone to you. Uh, you may have noticed that there's a kayaker on the water here behind me. Hi, Alec. Can we bring ca Alec's camera up on screen? So we've got Alec, he is our state park interpreter. Do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Alec and I'm here out on the water. As you can see, I'm on the kayak here at Point Lobo State Natural Reserve. And I'm out here on the ocean. So this is Point Lobo State Marine Reserve. And we're so thrilled to have you here joining us today. And we're gonna take you on a journey throughout California. But first and foremost, I kind of want to get you oriented to where Point Lobos is. So I wanted to bring up a map here to show you. Point Lobos, we're right here at those two pins in the middle. We're in the central coast of California, about two hours south of the San Francisco Bay and about five or six hours north of Los Angeles. So we're nestled here just south of the Monterey Bay, which is a place teeming with life. And we're so, so excited to have y'all here with us today. And as Erica said, no matter where you live, you are connected to the sea, no matter if you're inland uh, or on the coast. And, and speaking of connected to the sea, my, my shell phone is ringing. Wow. I, I rarely get calls on my shell phone, so I should take this one. Hold on. <clears throat> yes, this is Alec. No, I'm I'm sorry. The, the crusty, the crusty crab is no longer at this. And State Marine Reserve here in Monterey, California. My name's Interpreter Angie, and I'm here with California State Parks Dive Team. I'm joined by my friend behind the camera. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian, and I'm here with the Monterey Bay Aquarium here to celebrate World Ocean Day. That's right, everyone. We're so excited to have you here with us to celebrate this really special day that's upholding the importance of our world's ocean. And today we're going to be traveling 
throughout many state parks in California to learn about the importance of our healthy watersheds. California State Parks is proud to protect almost 300 of what many of us would probably say are some of our favorite places in California. Beautiful protected landscapes along our entire state. And we're really excited to travel to some of those places today and finish off in this amazing old growth health forest in many ways, one of the oldest marine protected areas in the state. We're so lucky to be joined by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So Mariah, tell us a little bit about how the Monterey Bay Aquarium is working to protect the ocean as well. That's right, hello everybody. It is the Monterey Bay Aquarium's mission to inspire conservation of the ocean. And we're hoping that by talking to you today underwater, and by you joining us on this journey as we go through our state park, we can inspire you to want to conserve our world ocean as well. That's right. So we're going to hear from a lot of our state park interpreters today as we explore the watersheds and why keeping them healthy is so important. We're really excited to have you join us once again underwater in the kelp forest, but we'll show you around some of this amazing habitat. Hopefully get to introduce you to some of the animals that rely on it and we'll be able to answer some of your questions as well. So we can't wait to talk to you in just a little bit. Until then, have a happy, happy World Ocean Day, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us. All right, wow, I can't wait to check in with our scuba divers again later on. It seems like it's gonna be such a fun day here at World Ocean Day based on Point Lobos. Now, I want to talk a little bit about our logo that we have here for World Ocean Day. And of course we have our, our logo right here, which is celebrating pride of the month of June. But I also want to bring up another logo and we held a student competition for the last couple months where students could design a World Ocean Day logo. And one of our winners, our grand prize winner, uh, Anisha from San Diego of Mrs. Harris's class designed this logo right here that we'll be using for the duration of our broadcast. And I wanted to, if you, if you can't read, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Anisha's design. Anisha depicted both the ocean and the human world in a yin yang design to represent harmony between the two. Anisha thinks it's very important to protect the ocean and its inhabitants because we rely, we rely on the ocean to thrive and survive. Her classroom community is dedicated to protecting the ocean by reusing materials and by picking up trash such as styrofoam, which is toxic. To sea creature. So thank you, Anisha. Congratulations to Anisha. And uh, also congratulations to our other two winners. Uh, all three winners and their classes got to have private Q&A VIP sessions with our scuba divers yesterday. And we just want to thank everyone who participated in the competition and for submitting their awesome design. So here's Anisha's design. Congrats to Anisha. Now, without further ado, we're going to go on and head to our first park. We're going to head over to Will at Palomar Mountain State Park. And we'll circle back later to Point Lobo. So we'll catch you on the flip side. Hey, thanks so much for the introduction, Alec. So, hey everybody, my name is Will. I'm a park interpretive specialist here at Palomar Mountain State Park in beautiful San Diego County. And I'll just kind of step, yeah, we'll show you right on the map there. We're in the southern part of the state, just above the Tijuana State Estuary. So we're about 20, 30 miles away from the coastline, but we've got a beautiful mountainous landscape here. So I just want to kind of show you guys what we can see here from the Booker Fire Lookout Tower, because I'm actually standing on a fire lookout tower up here as well. So I want to talk to you guys about the headwaters of our watershed. So I also want to show you guys our the San Luis Rey watershed where we are at Palomar Mountain State Park. So. Here's our watershed. It's a really big watershed with three main parts. The part out at the coastline, the middle parts where Ma uh, Palomar Mountain actually is, and then a big valley out in the east called the Henshaw Valley, where a big old reservoir sits called Henshaw Reservoir. So we've got a pretty large watershed, a lot of river and creeks that flow through this watershed, and it all eventually reaches the ocean. So I've got a question for our viewers. Where does the water in our watersheds come from? And we'll answer that a little bit later. So if you guys look out at this landscape, it's very, very foggy, very, very misty. And all of our water comes from the ocean. 
the ocean water heats up, it evaporates, and then it's blown on land where it eventually cools off and precipitates and it falls as rainfall or sleet or hail or even snow. And it collects in all of our streams and our creeks and our rivers. And that's what we call the headwaters of our watershed. So, um, yeah, the, the headwaters are extremely important to the watershed for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons, and I'll show you guys a picture of some of the snowpack that we've had up here at Palomar. As you can see, that's, there's a ton of snow, and that's actually really low elevation too. So all of the snow that we get that falls up here in the mountains, it melts, but some of it actually stays up here for months on end, and that contributes to the slow release of water in our watershed uh, for months. So because of the snowpack, that means that the creeks and the streams can be supplied with water for weeks and sometimes months afterwards. Uh, for another reason is for storing water in lakes and reservoirs. So I'll show you guys a picture of the Henshaw Reservoir now. That's, uh, that's out there at Lake Henshaw. Big, big reservoir with, that collects a lot of water from the surrounding valley. And it can, it, it's actually a, a pretty important place for wildlife. Lots of birds migrate from the shore into this inland uh, large lake, and they use it for feeding and breeding. And it's just an important economic uh important economically as well. So uh, on top of that, we also use the headwaters for drinking water, for hydropower plants, and it's also really important to rural economies as well. So I've got a second question for you all. Where does all of the salt in the ocean come from? That's one that you guys haven't thought about too much. Well, the headwaters rely on the ocean for water supply, but the ocean relies on the headwaters for its supply of nutrients and salts, believe it or not. So that being said, headwaters can be the first place that water quality can really be, that can really stay good or it can degrade quickly. So there are a lot of challenges that we face with water quality in the watershed here in the headwaters that eventually affect the rivers downstream and in turn the ocean. So here's a third question I have for you. What is the biggest threat to water quality in our watersheds? And I'm going to go now through a couple of the threats that we have and some of our challenges. And one of them is grazing. So if uh, our cattle and our sheep or whatever you happen to be grazing overgraze an area, that can cause more erosion in our streams and creeks. And that erosion can clog up the streams and cause water quality to go down. Also, if you look out here, we've got lots and lots of farming happening in these lower valleys. And farmers are usually pretty good about this, but sometimes fertilizers can leach from our soils into our watersheds, and that can cause problems too. We've also got resource extraction from people pulling sand and, and uh, ore and cobbles out for, for construction purposes. But we've also got challenges with dams and reservoirs, and not to mention rural expansion. As humans expand farther east out into the county, we deal with more and more problems with our watersheds as we change the way water courses move and we affect water quality in many ways in that regard. So as we continue to build out into rural, rural areas, that challenge is only gonna get hard, uh, only gonna become more challenging. So another huge thing, a huge challenge that we face out here in the headwaters, especially in uh, our forested regions, is wildfire. So I'm actually up coming you uh, up here, coming to you from this big uh, fire tower, and it's it's a really really good vantage point that looks out through the whole county, and it's really important to get on top of wildfires immediately here in San Diego County because if a forest burns down that leaves the soil completely barren. And all of the plants and all of the trees in the forest serve to really strengthen the soil and keep it in place. And when a big stand destroying fire, when a big forest, completely forest destroying fire, destroying fire comes through and wipes out an area that really leaves the soil with not a lot of protection, not a lot of stability, and we can get a lot of mudslides and landslides and that causes all kinds of havoc our watersheds. As all that soil gets into the water courses, that causes water quality to go down really badly. So with fires burning more and more intensely every year, uh, we're having to rethink how we approach wildfires. 
So because of our historic forest fire or because of our historic forest management, we've got a huge fuel load. Our, uh, we keep building homes into fire prone areas and that makes it harder. Not to mention greenhouse gas emissions going up every year, making, making the temperature hotter, making the, uh, the, just the whole, the whole environment more, uh, more prone to fire. Um, so I've talked about a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stuff that can affect the watershed from up here, but I also want to, uh, let's see here. Oh yeah. Um, sorry guys. <laughs> oh yes. Okay. So I actually want to ask you guys a fourth question now, and that is what is the longest river that flows through California? And this one might stump you a little bit. So the whole point of World Ocean Day here, for the reason I'm coming to you guys from a mountainous region, is because we want to emphasize that no matter where you are in a watershed, you can have an effect. You can have an impact on the ocean. And the reason I asked what the longest river in California is, well, the longest river that flows through California is actually the uh, Colorado River. And it starts in Colorado, but still flows through California. And that's a river that is almost uh, 1,450 miles long. So even if you live 20 miles from the coast, even if you live 100 miles from the coast, like Erica was saying earlier, even if you live 500 miles, 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles away from the coast, you can have an impact on the ocean. So I'll give you guys another cool statistic. The longest river in California is the Sacramento River at over 450 miles. The uh, There's several other rivers that are, I think a few of them over 200 miles and several that are over 100 miles. And our river right here in the San Luis Rey watershed is just about 70 miles. So that's 70 miles of watershed that could potentially be affected here and in turn the ocean out by Oceanside. So I've got a couple things that I want to share with you guys that can help you ways that you can help be, impact the ocean up here in the headwaters. So uh, just a couple small things you or you should or excuse me. Here's some big things that you guys should do. You should support prescribed burns because pres, uh, supporting pres, prescribed burns means that we can manage our fuel load and that will make fires less intense. We can work with local management. Uh, land managers to provide them with the best practices so that they know how to manage their what their uh, cattle their grazing and also their farming and we really need to support efforts to set aside land for conservation and here are some small things that each and every one of us can do to impact the ocean up here in the headwaters uh, so if you live in the urban wildland interface, that basically means if you live in a fire prone area, make sure your home is ready for wildfire. That means that if your home does burn or the area around your house burns, it will be ready and your house will survive. Thereby, there won't be as many pollutants going into our watershed. Uh, reduce and remove the use of pesticides, herbicides and concentrated fertilizers. Those things leach through the soil and make their way into our watershed. So if you can reduce those as much as possible, that's really great for the watershed and in turn, the ocean. Um, let's see, learning about local issues with invasive species uh, and learning um, practices to eradicate them, especially when it comes to aquatic species. The spread of aquatic species from the ocean or into from headwaters to the ocean and vice versa, that's a really big problem that we deal with. And so knowing about different invasive species and how to deal with them, that is definitely very important to know about. Um, there's a thousand and one ways that we can all reduce our carbon footprint. And that's something that we really need to try and do as the global concentration of carbon just keeps inching upward every single day. And then we also want to eat sustainable seafoods and avoid ocean harming products. The, you, those are some things that you need to look into to make sure that any products that you're buying are safe in terms of the way that they're sourced. And then last but not least, you guys, 
we need to use less plastic goods because the plastic is accumulating in our ocean at a staggering and an alarming rate. And a lot of that stuff that ends up in the ocean, sometimes it starts here in the headwaters and it just takes time for it to move all the way out to the ocean. So without further, I think that's pretty much covers it here at Palomar Mountain State Park. The headwaters are the starts of our watershed, the beginnings of our watershed, and they eventually reach the ocean. Will, it's so awesome to visit with you from down here on the coastline all the way up to Headwaters. Now, just to be clear, the watershed that Will is talking about is not the one that we're connected to here in Monterey. He's in far Southern California, but no matter where you are in the state, we've got these different watersheds. And if you're tuning in from outside of California, you're probably also in a watershed too. Will mentioned the Colorado River. That Colorado River runs through several states, actually my home state of Arizona. So I know that it passes by a lot of different populations. These rivers aren't just cutting through national parks and state parks, but they are passing by big cities, small towns, and everything in between. So yeah, maybe the drains in your community might end up going down into and connecting to local creeks, rivers, and eventually end up out here. But Will, you gave some really great actions. We did have a question come in and I was wondering, um, do you, have you recognized or have the environmental scientists at Palomar Mountain State Park noticed a decrease in the snowfall or the snowpack uh, due to climate change? That is a really fantastic question to which I do not have the immediate answer. I can't speak for them and I, I'm not sure if they have that data. although. I'm almost certain that we, we, we do keep track of all the snowpack here in the mountains. So I'm almost certain they do have that data. I'll speak. I do know that throughout. Oh, yeah. sorry about that. I, I do know that throughout the Sierra Mountains, the Sierra Range that runs through um, a, a, the long length of California, that we are experiencing reduced snowpack, which of course means that once that snow melts um, earlier on in the summer, there is less water moving down from those headwaters and the watersheds um, through our communities, so that we can use them for our drinking water, so we can use them for agriculture. So reduced snowpack, I know, is a problem that our state is experiencing, along with other places. Um, in the United States. Yeah, I, I don't have the data um, in front of me, but I'm almost positive. And speaking from experience, I've seen the winters up here every single year. And yeah, it seems like they're getting a little shorter every single season or the snowpack just doesn't last as long. And yeah, the creeks dry up sooner than, in that regard. Yeah, yeah, it's tough to see. And of course, that also contributes a bit to um, wildfire danger. As Californians, we are very aware of how um, wildfires have begun to really spread outside of a fire season and move into, you know, the spring and the fall. And now we even have fires in the wintertime. We had a fire here in Big Sur, California in February. So pretty amazing to see how this phenomenon is is spreading. That um. That fire photo that you shared on screen, how long ago was that wildfire that occurred there in Palomar? That was the Witch Fire, and that occurred in 2007. And that was a very large fire that not only burned here on the mountain, but in multiple areas throughout the county. And I just want to mention, like you said, the fire season has extended. I'm actually up here at the fire tower itself, and we have volunteer fire lookouts, and they are having to stay in the tower sometimes longer periods throughout the day. So normally your shift is eight hours. Sometimes they get extended to 10 hours and they've been having to stay, like you said, well into winter to make sure we have watchful eyes over the county. Yeah, it's really important. I know some of my friends who work at Cal Fire are recognizing that they, they don't have a seasonal job anymore. They are working year round um, to protect our wildlands. Well, Will, it's been really great chatting with you. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your watershed and your headwaters with us. It's really good to be thinking about how inland populations, whether you're in the inland deserts or in the mountains, that you are connected to our world global ocean. So thank you for joining us, Will. Um, we are going to now head up to a different part of the state. We're going to head up north to Humboldt County to visit our friend Cleo in Humboldt Redwoods State Park. Is Cleo here with us? I'm here. Oh, there she is. Hi, Cleo. Hi. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Awesome. Well, first of all, thanks, Will, for telling me about Palomar Mountains. I've never been there, so it was really cool to learn about that place, especially since I'm so far away. Hi, happy World Ocean Day. My name is Cleo, and I am an interpreter here at Humboldt Redwood State Park. You can see all these beautiful redwoods around me. And this state park is in far northern California. 
So if we could bring up that map and show everyone kind of where I'm at, I'm pretty much like on the opposite side of California, way up at the top, about three hours away from the Oregon border. So I'm a little far away. It's, it's a little far. So I'm here standing in the South Fork of the Eel River. I don't know if you can see me in here, but here I am here to talk to you today about rivers and our watersheds and how they are connected to our oceans and how we are connected to these rivers, even if we're so far away from our oceans and how all of our impacts on these rivers can also affect the oceans over there. But before we get into that, let's kind of explain what a watershed is. I know Will kind of touched on it earlier in this presentation, but I like to explain watersheds as an area of land in which all of the water from all of the rain, all the precipitation, and all of the surface water, such as these creeks and little streams, sheds into like one single water course, such as a bigger river, a lake, a reservoir, or even the ocean. So right now I'm standing in the South Fork of the Eel River watershed, which is part of the greater Eel River watershed. So if we could pull up that map, that'd be awesome. So the Eel River watershed is actually the third largest watershed in California. It, flow, it starts all the way down south, or not down south, but in like central California towards Lake County, flows through Mendocino County, through Trinity County, and then eventually ends up in Humboldt County and exits out to the Pacific Ocean. So this watershed has over 800 miles of river of water running through it. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of land that surrounds that and a lot of things can impact this watershed. So all of this water leads to the ocean. Have you ever, uh, have you ever seen the movie Finding Nemo and heard the phrase, all drains lead to the ocean? That's pretty true. And it holds true for these rivers as well. All of these rivers eventually make their way to the ocean. All the water and anything that is carried in the water, such as sediment, such as nutrients, can flow and affect the oceans miles away. Right now I'm about 40 miles away from the Pacific Ocean right now. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of things that carry, that are carried in here. Not only that, things that are not only non-living, but things that are living as well. Up here in Northern California, we have a bunch of salmon and these salmon are really important to the indigenous peoples in the area. They use it as a main food source to sustain themselves. And these salmon are also really important ecologically to this whole ecosystem. So they start their lives in the rivers, they are born in the rivers and then they hatch and then make their way all the way to the ocean, sometimes a hundred miles away to the ocean. And then they become adults and then come all the way back to the same river that they were born at to lay their eggs again. And then that cycle continues. So after they spawn, after they lay their eggs, they'll die on the riverbanks and then their nutrients actually gets recycled into the ecosystem. So that whole migration route is really important for these salmon. It's also really important for the ecosystem and really important for the, peop the native peoples around this area. So it's important that we keep their migration route really clean and really healthy so that we can keep that life cycle going, that migration route going. But even though there are these really cool things that travel all the way to the oceans from these rivers, there's also some things that can impact these critters. So one thing that I wanna talk about is invasive species. And it just so happens that World Ocean Day is right smack dab in the middle of California Invasive Species Action Week. It's really long. It's put on the, by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to help promote or bring aware of in the invasive species around this area. So what is an invasive species though? It's a pretty broad term, um, but it's basically any species, plant or animal that is introduced from one area into a new area. So it's native, it's indigenous to its old area, but then it's accidentally or on purpose brought 
into this new area. And because it's brand new to this area, it doesn't have any natural predators. So there's really nothing to keep their population in check. And that's what's happening right now with the New Zealand mud snail. So if we could bring up that pic of the mud snail, it's pretty cute, right? Right. But so as the name implies, the New Zealand mud snail was brought over on accident all the way from New Zealand into our California waters. So uh, in California, all of these mud snail populations are actually female and they reproduce by cloning. So it's pretty cool when you think about it, but it's actually pretty devastating because their population can increase super fast. So a single adult female New Zealand mud snail can produce up to 230 offspring. And those, each of those offspring are already pregnant. Isn't that crazy? So one female, 230 babies that are already pregnant. As you can imagine, their population can boom super quickly. And these mud snails devastate our freshwater rivers in that they basically outcompete our local native benthic macroinvertebrate. Well, but, what's, but what's benthic macroinvertebrate, Cleo? I know, it's a long word. Benthic macroinvertebrate are basically these little aquatic insects that live at the bottom of our rivers and streams. And these benthic macroinvertebrate, these aquatic in insects, are super important to the life cycle of our salmon up here. They're basically the main food source as they're traveling up and down the river to the oceans. So these mud snail populations outcompete these macroinvertebrates. So what that means is that these salmon can only eat these mud snails. And as you saw earlier, they have those teeny tiny, really hard shells. So that means that these salmon can't digest them. They can't obtain the nutrients that the mud snails have as they can with the other benthic macroinvertebrate. So that means the snail just passed through them. The snail is still alive and can still reproduce. And, it's, and the salmon that try to eat those mud snails end up starving and their life cycle cannot continue and they can't finish their migration route from the river to the ocean, back up the river and spawn. They just die out instead. So that really does affect our local communities, our local indigenous people and our environment, our ecosystem. So how are these invasive mud snails spreading? Well, they are super tiny, not like the picture kind of showed. They're teeny tiny, maybe like two millimeters in size. They're teeny tiny. And as you can imagine, me just standing here with my little boots on, they could stick onto those, right? So that's how they're moved from river to river, from water body to water body is that they'll stick onto anything. They'll stick onto your waders, they'll stick onto these boots, they'll stick onto your boats, your kayaks, anything that you have in the water, they will stick onto. And, you, and sometimes you don't know that they're on your stuff because they're so tiny. And so they're transported from river to river and then can devastate that new river that they're on. So what can we do about it? you may ask. Well, there's this process called clean, drain, dry. And I have a cute little picture from a past year's contest from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. A student drew it in 2014. So basically it advocates that once you're done recreating in your river, in your water body, you clean your stuff, your boots, your boats, you drain it completely so that there's no water inside of it. And then you let it dry completely. So that takes care of anything that's stuck on your stuff, your boots, your boats, that kills it off. And so you don't have to worry about transplanting these invasive species from water body to water body. But this doesn't just stop the New Zealand mud snail. This also stops 
other species that we have in California. So there's not just these mud snails, there's also Elodia and Eurasian water milfoil, which are these aquatic plants that invade water courses. They basically take up all the oxygen and literally choke out rivers. They choke it out, they take out all the oxygen so that no fish, nothing can really survive in there besides those invasive species. And you can't even boat in it because it's so dense. It creates a river that you can't even walk through, can't even boat through. The same process can also help uh, mitigate against quagga and zebra mussels, which are much more of a problem out in our oceans. So these uh, invasive mushroom, mu not mushrooms, mussels also came from another place and they have invaded our water out in the oceans. So what they do is that they're transported the same way unknowingly, they stick onto stuff and then they just grow and grow and grow and choke out any pipes, any engines inside um, that are sitting in our oceans and our water bodies. So it can kill your boat, really. Cleo, that is really amazing to get to visit the South Fork of the Eel River with you. Um, we are just checking in. We're getting our divers reset um, underwater here in a moment, but I did want to share a couple questions with you. Um, it is so awesome to, to learn about uh, your watershed there and to see how the things and the actions that we can take to really help really reduce the spread of invasive species. Um, you mentioned the New Zealand mud snail. Um, here in our kelp forest, which is very healthy and thriving in um, Whaler's Cove here in Point Lobos, um, unfortunately is also a victim of an invasive species. It's uh, the devil weed or uh, Sargassum horneri. So that's a different type of kelp species that's coming in and it also outcompetes. And so we have real concern for that right here in our marine protected area. Now, I had a question for you um, coming in from some viewers about the salmon that move through the Eel River. What is the seasonality of that? And when the salmon leave your river, where do they go? So usually uh, we see them around late fall, winter time when the water levels kind of rise up. So at that time, they make their way to the oceans. So here at the Eel River or at the South Fork, they'll, the South Fork meets up with the main stem of the Eel River which eventually gets all the way to the Pacific Ocean, about 45 miles northwest of me here. So they make that long journey themselves just to get to the ocean. Yeah, and I know that once they get out of the ocean, they're moving up and down our coastline. You can fish for salmon in a lot of places, of course, during fishing season and with a fishing license. Um, the salmon are also really important in our global ocean because they are a key food source for some species. Um, some of you may be familiar with the orca or the killer whale. Um, the population of orcas up in uh, the northwest uh, in the Washington state area, uh, the resident orcas there feed primarily on salmon. And when we're talking about the health of our rivers and watersheds and the availability of the salmon, as a food source, not only for Californians, indigenous people, our Californians population, even as exports in our fisheries to sell our salmon to other parts of our country or the world. But the salmon also feeds really key species. So those orca, the killer whales, they are the ocean's apex predator. They are the top one. And if they're not able to get the food that they need, like the salmon, because the New Zealand mud snail has snuffed out their populations in the rivers, it can just be a really what we call a cascading effect through the different um, trophic cascades, through the different um, populations within the ocean. So it is really important that we're thinking about that watershed connectivity, wherever you are on planet Earth, you are connected to the ocean and really great to have these actions that we can take. So um, Chloe, are you gonna clean those boots before you uh, move on to another river? Oh, I'm definitely gonna clean these boots, yes. <laughs> yes, it's a good reminder. And I'm I'm an avid scuba diver and a kayaker, and I absolutely love to get out into the water, but it is a good reminder to clean your gear and dry your gear to really reduce the transportation of those invasive species that can really change these ecosystems and not necessarily for the better. Well, thank you so much, Chloe. It's been great visiting with you. 
Thank you. We are going to head on down the coastline. We're going to check in with a, uh, a completely different park back down in the south now. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Tijuana Estuary. And there's our friend Empress. Hi, Empress. Happy World Ocean Day. It's so good to see you. All right. I don't know if I'm having your audio. Let's just check your audio really quick. Sorry about that. Hello. Can you hear me All now? All right. There you good are. Good to go. Yeah, we can hear you now. And I can see uh, the Tijuana Estuary there behind you. Go ahead and take it away. Yes. Hi. Hello, everyone. Well, happy World Oceans Day. My name is Empress. I'm an interpreter for California State Parks here at the Tijuana River National Estuary and Research Reserve. That is a really, really long name, I know. Uh, but we are down here in Imperial Beach, all the way down in San Diego, California. Uh, so the complete opposite end of the state of where our friends were speaking to you all from earlier. Um, and I want to show you our watershed here at the Tijuana River watershed um, because it's a very interesting one. Um, so I've got a map and it really shows you how complex our system is here. So you can see our watershed actually bisects an international boundary. So 75% of our watershed is in Mexico, and the other 25% is here in the United States. Now this watershed spans over 1,750 square miles, uh, so it's very, very massive. Um, and we are in that red section at the very far left of that map there. Um, so we're at that very end point of that dark blue line uh, that flows across the border and into the estuary, which is the Tijuana River. Now, if you don't know what an estuary is, it's a place where freshwater and saltwater meet and mix together. Uh, so we say it's a place where the river meets the sea, right? The only issue is that in San Diego, as many San Diegans know, we don't get a lot of rain. Um, so there's not a lot of fresh water being put into the system um, that flows from the Tijuana River uh, across the border and into our estuary meaning that most of the water here is salt water. So you're looking at river channels here that were formed by the Tijuana River, but this is actually salt water directly from the ocean, uh, which comes up through our river mouth a little bit further south of where I'm standing right now. And because this is such a dynamic habitat, right, meaning there's so much movement, there's a lot of change that happens here, um, that also makes us pretty unique for the habitats that are here as well as for the species that are here. Um, and because we are actually part of the most southwestern point in the continental United States, right, if you went any further south, you'd be in another country. And if you went any further west, you'd be in the Pacific Ocean. Um, that can kind of make conservation a little bit tricky here, um, having an international border within um, our watershed. But we do have a great history of conservation. We're very thankful for that. And much of that starts with the work of a Mike and Patricia McCoy, who were environmental professionals, activists, and residents of Imperial Beach uh, for a very long time. And they worked extensively over the course of about 10 years or so um, to lobby congressmen, to visit Washington, D.C., um, and to work really hard to get this place the recognition that it deserved. And because of that work, as well as coincidentally work that had been done on a, an endangered bird species that's found here in the estuary, we actually earned our designation as a wildlife refuge. And in 1982, we were site selected by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, to be part of their Sentinel program. Um, so we now operate as a state and, by, and uh, federal partnership uh, between California State Parks, as well as the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and with NOAA. And so work that's done here at our estuary actually contributes to a very, very large database um, that helps climate scientists all around the world understand how coastal wetlands um, are actually changing and adapting to climate change and to sea level rise. Uh, so we do some pretty cool stuff here. Very excited about that. Very fortunate to be able to work here as well. Um, and we have had some pretty big wins since 1982. Um, uh, habitat restoration is a very big effort here. Uh, we are working, we have restored habitat, we are working on restoring more habitat for the endangered species that we have. We have quite a few plant and bird species as well. Um, and also more recently, um, we have worked with NOAA's Marine Debris Program since 2014 um, to, sorry, um, we've worked with them since 2014 to really kind of help manage the flow of marine debris that comes across the border, um, but also working with organizations and with political uh, entities in Mexico uh, to 
focus on addressing uh, emergency preparedness and, and marine debris flow that comes across the border, but also to work on a more circular economic approach to repurposing waste in the city of Tijuana, um, which you can actually see behind me. So we are very close to Mexico. Those mountains that are back there, that's Mexico. Uh, so it's just a few miles away and it kind of looks like it's way off in the distance, but I can very clearly see homes and buildings from here. And sometimes you can see traffic, sometimes. Um, but in addition to that, um, our binational liaison here, her name is Anna Iguiarte, she's amazing, um, but she actually led a group of nonprofit organizations here in the U.S. and in Mexico to actually work with the city of Tijuana to ban, to ban plastic bags, and that effort was successful in 2018, um, and Tijuana actually became the first U.S.-Mexico border city and the largest as well to ban plastic bags, and that really helped cut down a lot of the uh, debris that flows across the river and into the estuary because much of that is in the form of plastic, uh, plastic bottles or small microplastics, but also plastic bags. Um, so we were really, really excited about that, and um, I think there are several cities in Mexico that have since followed suit. So. That's pretty exciting work. Um, and really, it's not an all encompassing solution, right? But it does help cut down on some of that flow. And when you consider the, uh, the impact that estuaries have on the rest of the world, that's pretty important, right? So there are a number of ecosystem services that are provided by estuaries. Um, and ours is, it's not a super huge estuary, but it's pretty, pretty incredible work that gets done here, regardless of the size. Um, so estuaries um if anybody loves seafood actually i love seafood um, i'm half filipino so we eat plenty of it um but actually 75 percent of the seafood that's caught and consumed by humans actually depend on estuaries for the beginning stages of their lives so estuaries are also known as the nurseries of the sea right this is a pretty calm environment you can see there's no crashing waves or massive amounts of erosion that's happening in here it's a really great spot for juvenile species to live until they're big enough and they can go out into the open ocean uh, so there are species like california halibut or leopard sharks mullets we have arrow gobies or long jaw mudsuckers all types of of marine species that live in here, uh, crab species as well. But also salt marsh habitat, which we have plenty of here at our estuary, about 235 acres of intact coastal salt marsh. Um, and salt marsh habitats, man, they are incredible. Um, and it's such low growing habitat. You can see some of our salt marsh behind me, all of these really low growing plants in the background there just across the river channel. Um, but they kind of act like sponges, right? So they help humans um, and infrastructure and homes that are further inland, all that wave energy that comes in when we have big storms, they buffer that, right? And they soak up a lot of that water before all of that reaches inland, okay? But also, it works going the opposite direction, out to sea, um, because they also act like a sponge and that, well, they also act like a filter because they filter out all of the pollutants that comes from all the runoff from hard surfaces that are further inland. Uh, so before all those oils and detergents and trash reach the open ocean, our estuary captures a good amount of it. And so do estuaries around the world as well. Um, but also, big picture is that salt marsh habitats are extremely effective at removing carbon dioxide out of the air. In fact, salt marsh plants are the most effective at it. Um, and so they store it underground for a very, very long period of time. Um, so we work really hard to help conserve but also restore more salt marsh habitat too. And of course, we want to maximize this, uh, these, these benefits for as long as possible, right? And so, which is why we are working to conserve 30% uh, of our lands and waters by 2030. And here are some ways that you can actually help protect estuaries, right? Because that is not just the work of lawmakers around the world. Um, and I do have a graphic to show you guys here. Um, but some of the ways that you can do that is by using non-toxic um, pesticides or herbicides and fertilizers, using native plants, right? Um, making sure you're fishing respectively, um, thinking before you pour any kind of chemicals down the drain, because yes, everything does lead to the ocean, um, and reimagining plastic waste. There are so many different types of things you can do with plastic. It's incredible now. Um, but yes, you can help, uh, you do impact your watersheds, right, for better or for worse, so why not for the better? And we invite you all to come on down here to the Tijuana Estuary to visit us to learn more about estuaries and what you can do to protect them. 
Awesome. That's so great, Empress. We really appreciate getting a moment to visit with you there in the Tijuana Estuary Reserve. It's just, it's so amazing to think about all these different places we have in California, from the mountains to the redwood forests, our inland deserts, and even our estuaries. Now, you touched on a couple of those ecosystem services, like being little nurseries for the baby fish and invertebrates that, you know, will supply our fisheries, right? Our fish right. stocks. Um, carbon sequestration in the salt marsh, that is an awesome ecosystem service. Also, one of the things that I wanted to touch on was how a lot of communities um, in California have been built on top of what were once estuaries. They were once filled in. Now, you did mention that there's been some restoration work at Tijuana Estuary. Did that happen there? Did that occur at any point? Yeah, so uh, we that is a very good point to make. Yes, we have lost 90% of coastal wetlands like this here in the state of California. So it's extremely alarming. Um, and we have had some restoration efforts here. Um, there is actually a book on the ecology of wetland, wetland restoration. And that book is considered to be like this, this, this incredible guide about how to further restore uh, coastal wetlands. And that work was actually done here at the Tijuana Estuary by Dr. Joy Zedler. Um, and we worked to see how uh, salt marsh plants like the one here can actually, can they grow with salt water or can they survive with fresh water too? Um, and so using the data that we get there, we are actually applying that to a 200 acre restoration site a little bit further south of us called Model Marsh. Um, and that work will actually work on, uh, will go towards helping, uh, we have an endangered bird here known as the light-footed Ridgeways rail, and it's the, this is actually home to the second largest population in the state, and so that work directly impacts that bird species, but, you know, also a few others as well, and yes, yes, many, many coastal wetlands are lost like this because we want to live right by the ocean, right? That's, that's what yeah, we love here about California. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's great. You know, restoration of our estuaries, um, even sand dune habitats, um, they also act as a buffer against uh, sea level rise. The ocean is rising because of um, melting glaciers and melting snowpack. We do know that uh, the, the water itself of the ocean is expanding because it's getting warmer. We learned that, you know, in elementary science, when things get hot, they expand, right? So sea levels are rising because ocean temperatures are increasing and there's more input of water into the ocean. So when we have things like healthy estuary ecosystems and we have those, uh, you know, sand dune habitats that can help buffer our communities, you know, building right on the California coastline isn't the smart thing to do anymore with our rising uh, sea levels. So um, really fantastic information you shared there, Empress. Um, um, it's just been really great to visit with you. And thank you for sharing some actions that we can take to help reduce our impacts, not only there on our estuaries, but all through our watersheds before they connect to the ocean. So again, those, those things like eating sustainable seafood, knowing where your seafood comes from and that it's caught and harvested in a sustainable fashion, reducing the amount of plastic that you even let into your life. Recycling is not the answer. Refusing plastic is the first step before you reduce and you reuse and recycling should be your last option. So really great actions. Empress, thanks so much for sharing your estuary with us. We are going to transition on now and um, head actually here to Point Lobos. My friend Alec is still out on the water here behind me. Alec, we're going to kick it over to you now. Yes, thanks, Erica. Welcome back. I am out here on the water on the kayak and i want to show everyone where i'm at right now uh, so this is whaler's cove it's a it's a portion of point lobos and over there uh, where those rocks are that's where our our crew is so shout out to our crew for making this happen today and throughout this week um, they're out there with our dive team audio team video team it's a lot of infrastructure and time and effort and planning that's gone into it so i wanted to shout out to them but yeah, this is Whaler's Cove here at Point Lobos. As you can see, it's a gorgeous day. Couldn't be better. It's probably about 60 degrees, sunny, partly cloudy. We have our Monterey Pine Forest over there lining the shore. And out there is Carmel Bay. It's a smaller bay, not the, the size of a bay such as Monterey Bay, but across the water, it's pretty difficult to see. There's some green slopes on shore. And that there is Pebble Beach Golf Course and Carmel by the Sea over there so i just wanted to sort of center us and and, and let y'all know where we are this is my kayak here this is the kelp kayak so we do some ports programs from and uh this is 
the, the kelp. This is the, the star of the show here at Point Lobos in Whalers Cove. And right underneath the water here are our friends, the scuba divers, which we'll be going to very shortly. And um, I just, I know we've seen so much so far. Uh, we've started and the mountains down to the, the rivers and, and into the estuaries and in way different parts of California. So I wanted to center us and I know Erica did this earlier, but I think it's just a good exercise to do. Uh, let's just take a couple of breaths to digest everything we've seen so far. So we'll take two in with the nose, out with the mouth. Ready? One and two. Feels good, doesn't it? And now Erica mentioned this before, but over 50% of our oxygen that we breathe, that powers us, that allows us to live, uh, comes from the ocean. And I'm sure a lot of you are asking, Alec, how could a big bowl of salt water be producing oxygen? What's going on there? Well, my friends, it is not the big bowl of salt water that's producing the oxygen. It's what's growing in the salt water that's producing this oxygen. So I want to introduce you to the kelp forest all this surrounding me and underneath my kayak in this photo you can see if you were to take a uh if you were to drop a camera and this is what our scuba divers are seeing right now this is our giant brown kelp forest and uh the giant brown kelp forest is not only pretty but it also provides an essential habitat and it's critical to our survival not just the animals but humans too so over a thousand different species rely on the kelp forest uh, for a place to find food, a place for shelter, a place to find a mate, and a place to reproduce. As an animal, what more are you looking for? That's That hits all the marks of survival for an animal. But you'll find out soon that it gives us a lot, besides just the oxygen as well. So I want to introduce you uh, to an animal that lives here in the kelp forest. Now, this here, this shell, belongs to a creature we call the abalone. This is a red abalone. You can, you can see from the, the shell color, but look underneath and you'll find some glimmering colors. It might be difficult to see through my camera and the sun's direct reflection, but there's an iridescence that comes with the, the bottom of an abalone shell. Purples and blues and greens. It's mesmerizing to look at. You may have seen this before. And it's not just pretty. This is a, an animal that has sustained life for thousands of years. You see, the people who have inhabited this land for since time immemorial, we're talking about the Rooms and Ohlone peoples and the Esalen peoples. Uh, these are indigenous tribes that still are in this area today, but they've been here for at least 10,000 years and they've relied on the abalone for survival. It provided uh, food, sustenance. It was not only delicious to eat, but it was widely available. We know it's widely available because as you walk through these trails here at Point Lobos, as you're walking on the trails and you observe the hillsides, you'll notice a shining glimmer that comes from the trails. And that shining glimmer, my friends, are crushed up abalone shells, stacked and stacked, piled and piled for thousands of years. And you might say Point Lobos is a dump, a landfill full of abalone. Now, if you've ever been to Point Lobos, I'm sure you find it insulting to refer to this place as a dump. But essentially, when you break it down, that's what a lot of this place is. So the Rooms in Ohlone, the Esalen peoples, these are Native American groups of peoples who have been here for so long, they relied on this as a staple food source. And um, later on, this became a food source for many more people. We fast forward to 1898. And a couple of entrepreneurs come to Point Lobos. They scope the scene. They notice that there's plenty of abalone. They see it in the trails. They see it uh, all over the hillsides. And when they dive below the surface, coated with these abalone. And just to clarify, friends, an abalone is like a giant sea snail. And apparently, I've never tried it myself, it is quite delicious. Uh, but these uh, these folks who decided to set up shop here um, and, and start fishing for abalone, called the Point Lobos Canning Company. They became extremely successful. Uh, so successful, in fact, so successful that they eliminated every last one of the abalone here at Point Lobos. There were zero abalone left. They cleaned out in about 30 years. And actually they were based, their cannery, 
was in our parking lot where our whole film crew is right now, where uh, people park their cars every single day. That's where the cannery was. And the cannery is just a place where uh, animals are, are cooked, canned, and shipped worldwide. So just as today, you would go to the grocery store and find a can of tuna, chicken of the sea, right? Back in the early 1900s, you can go to a grocery store in California and some places all over the world and find canned abalone. It was extremely common. So they wiped out all the abalone and stories like the abalone persist throughout Point Lobo. So we don't just have the abalone, but we have the stories of the tree. So all these trees you see behind me, a hundred years ago, there were no trees here at Point Lobos. They cleaned those up through forestry and then grazing in cattle. And then you have things like the whales. This here is Whalers Cove. So Azorean whalers, the Azores is a group of islands off the coast of Portugal. They came here to Point Lobos in the 1860s and they wiped out large swaths of the gray whale, blue, uh, humpback whale, blue whales as well, and right whale populations. And then of course you have the sea otters. Now I don't wanna to delve too deep into the story of the sea otters. I wanna save that for maybe our divers, but let's just say friends that we're lucky to still see some sea otters today. So Point Lobos is really a story of resource exploitation as people taking things from the land. But guess what? Even after a series of terrible, horrendous decisions, you can still bounce back with one decision. I know a lot of us may have learned about that in our own lives, but that happened here at Point Lobos. So this place is a thinly veiled business park where we're at now because in 1933, they decided to make this a state reserve forever protecting this place. And in 1960, they made this ocean part a state marine reserve. It's one of the oldest marine protected areas in the state of California, not the United States. Um, and our divers will also be talking more about that a little bit later. So it was a very good decision to make this place a reserve and protect this spot, this gorgeous crown jewel of Point Lobos. Now I mentioned before that Point Lobos and uh, this, this kelp here, Let's get a close up on the kelp. Provides benefits to not only animals, but humans as well. And, and the, the animals on here, some of the common ones you're gonna see are sea otters and harbor seals. You might see some cabazon and rockfish, uh, giant sea bass live in here, all sorts of critters. But for, for humans, these kind of kelp forests are gonna provide a barrier, a wall for when, as we know, sea levels are rising and when those winter storms are penetrating the coast, this kind of kelp forest is gonna help dampen that wave energy. It's gonna help protect us from those waves as sea levels rise. So uh, this is something that's gonna protect our community. So uh, making sure that we protect our kelp forest is making sure that we protect our coastal communities as well from erosion, flooding, and all that kind of stuff. Now I do have a favor for you. In order to protect these habitats, uh, every time I'm out on my kayak, I find pieces of trash. I find uh, plastic straws, I find masks, I found grocery bags, and I'm happy to do that because I'm out here and I wanna help this place that I work at and I love. But a favor I ask of you, no matter where you live, you're all connected to the ocean. And as we learned from Finding Nemo, a lot of drains lead to the ocean. So my favor to you is make sure that your trash gets sealed in a trash bag in a trash can and it's not blowing away. Uh, because that Cheeto bag that you were eating out of on your lunch break in Minnesota in a couple months could end down in the Gulf of Mexico in the Caribbean. And we just have to make sure we protect our world. We're all connected. No person lives on an island, right? So things, uh, and if you wanna go a step further besides just picking up your trash, try to invest in some reusables. And when I say invest, I mean, it's pretty cheap. I have a reusable water bottle out of convenience, out of laziness. I just don't like carrying around those big plastic water bottles, getting those cases and loading them up into the into my shopping cart. So I have a reusable water bottle. I found this for like a couple bucks and this makes it easy. I can store my duct tape around here because I always am breaking stuff. And I need to fix it. Uh, other stuff, if you really like to sip out of a straw, invest in a reusable straw. It's really not too expensive folks. And if, if you're really set on, on drinking from a straw, you can find that. And other things like reusable grocery bags, pretty simple. Empress was mentioning the whole city of Tijuana. Shout out to TJ for making sure that they eliminate plastic bags. That is a move of a community trying to, to, to help themselves ultimately and help this world. 
So that's just something that you can do. So today we learned uh, a, a whole bunch of stuff. We learned that oxygen is produced by the, the kelp forest and by the ocean. Over 50% of our oxygen is produced by that. We learned that we got to conserve seafood. All right, seafood tastes good. Eat sustainable seafood so your children and your grandchildren can, can, eat, can keep eating them. We don't want to keep eating, you know, that all that farm raised stuff. And uh, our individual actions do affect the health of the ocean. And ultimately, it will affect us as well. It all comes back around, right? Um, so, Erica, I know you're a big fan of the kelp forest. Do you have I anything know. you would like to add? Oh, I just want to thank you. You did a really good overview of the kelp and of abalone. Um, you know, abalone obviously was a, a population of species that really crashed in this area, not just here in Point Lobos, but in the central and northern coast of California. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that we were just extracting it. And that's where our marine protected areas come into play. Again, this is the Point Lobo State Marine Reserve. It has the highest level of protection for California's marine protected areas. What a state marine reserve is, it means that there is no take allowed. So you can't fish here. You can't try to collect abalone or mussels. Even the shells and the driftwood along the beach, the rocks, everything here is protected. And so we just let it be. You'll hear a little bit more about that from the divers. But the good thing is, is because of the protections here in the State Marine Reserve, there are abalone that are starting to come back. And there are some that are living here again in Whaler's Cove, which is awesome to see. So really great reminder though about sustainable seafood. And right now abalone fisheries are closed. You can um, purchase and eat abalone if you get the farm raised stuff. There's uh, a Monterey abalone farm uh, here in our harbor. Um, but really just knowing where your seafood comes from. Um, the Seafood Watch app by the Monterey Bay Aquarium, uh, Seafood Watch gives you the opportunity to really clearly understand whether the seafood that you might be buying at a restaurant or in the grocery store is sustainable. Um, whether it's green light, yellow light, or red light. You should definitely go for it versus try to avoid it versus don't buy that. So if you've got the Seafood Watch uh, app, you can pull it up on uh, your phone, have it with you, and it'll just give you the opportunity to know what you're eating and know where your food comes from. So really good reminder on um, all those other actions as well, um, Alec. Big one for the kelp too are land sea pollutants, right? We were exploring up through our watersheds, the headwaters, the rivers, the estuaries. If there's a lot of pollution and runoff coming from land, even sedimentation from wildfires and erosion and coastal development, that sediment can really impact the health of these waters. Kelp likes really cold, very nutrient rich water, but it doesn't want a lot of sediment because it needs to photosynthesize. And that's where we're gonna kind of transition now down to our divers. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about the kelp forest. I know this is something that we have all been waiting for. This is a really great collaboration, both between California State Parks and Monterey Bay Aquarium. And we have both underwater with you right now, live dives. We've got divers from Monterey Bay Aquarium with us. We've got our state parks dive team. I was down in the water with them yesterday and the Kelp Cathedral is just in full force. It's beautiful down there and we're really excited to be sharing it with you. So when we go down underwater with the divers, you're gonna be checking in with our friend Angie, who's the state parks interpreter and Mariah from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They're going to be showing you around the kelp forest as well as sharing a little bit of information about the species that you're going to see. And they're also going to be introducing more actions that we can all take in our daily lives, whether we are here on the coastline or far, far inland, miles and miles from the coast. Remember, your life is connected to this big, beautiful ocean and its health relies on you and you rely on its health. It's that reciprocity. All right. And that's something that's really important to remember. So I think we're about ready to go for our divers. Um, let's see if they're underwater. Can you guys hear me? Hey, Erica, here we are. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. You're coming through nice and clear, Angie. Great to see you underwater. Happy World Ocean Day. The forest here at Point Lobos. Before we even get into introductions and start talking, we just want to take a moment to really show you around where we are today. I invite everybody to take a nice, big few breaths and be in gratitude for the world ocean that we all share. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful day in the kelp forest, as everyone can see. 
Absolutely. We've got a little uh, black and yellow rockfish right here I want to show you before we get into programming because they might not hang around for too long. Can you see them, Mariah? Yes, I can. Can everybody on the surface see our rockfish, friends? Yeah, we can see the rockfish. If you could go in maybe a little bit closer. We don't want to oh. scare him or disturb him. Oh, there he is. He's going into his little den. All right. Well, now that we've all had a moment to see where we are today and meet our first creature here in the kelp forest, that was a black, a black and yellow rockfish, one of the many rockfish that you can find here at Point Lobos. Let's get into introductions. My name is Angie, and I'm an interpreter for California State Park. And I'm joined here by uh, Mariah from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Mariah, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Mariah. I'm here with the Monterey Bay Aquarium, as Angie said. We're making a statement to inspire conservation of the ocean. And we're hoping that by having you come on a dive with us today, we can help inspire each and every one of you as well. So welcome. Awesome. We're so excited to be able to join you all for World Ocean Day today. And what better way to do it than from one of California's six habitats off our coastline, the giant kelp forest, one of my all-time favorite places to see for sure. And I'm so excited to share this special place with all of you. So I'm sure you heard a little bit about where we are today, which is the Point Lobos State Natural Reserve and the Point Lobos State which is one of California's 124 marine protected areas along the coast that all work together to form a network of protection uh, to make sure that our ocean maintains health and biodiversity. The kelp forest is one of the, has the most variety and the most diversity of different types of animals that you can see, one of the most for sure. And we wanna be able to show you some of that, inspire you to protect the ocean, and really drive home the point that all of our watersheds, all of the water on our planet is connected, right? And we're all responsible for being stewards of these amazing places. That's right, Andy. So now that we're here, how about we start taking a gander? Let's look around and see if we've got any local residents we can check out and teach you about. Yes, absolutely. So we want to make sure you have some time to look around and see what there is to see down here. So let's take a look. You might notice a lot of this pink stuff that's covering the rocks. Um, these big rocks and boulders that you see on the ground, they make up another peak habitat in California's coastline, which is the rocky reef environment. And this is a place where a lot of animals like to live. It's also a place where our kelp hangs on to. So why don't we go over here, Mariah, and show them some um, anatomy of the kelp, starting with our hold fast. So we have a really good example right here behind me, if you can okay. kind of tuck into this rock. Ooh, for everybody watching, yeah. this bright yellow rope is what's allowing me to talk to all of you. But right here, we have our kelp hold fast, which is a lot like the roots of the kelp. And this big mat of the hold fast is holding on to a rocky surface, right? So this is basically what anchors the kelp to the seafloor. Moving up the kelp, we see our stipes, which are right here. And this is basically the connector from the seafloor to the surface. The thing that's helping our kelp to stay reaching towards the sun, because like Erica mentioned, our kelp is a photosynthesizer, meaning it relies on sunlight to grow what was that? and make energy. So these little bladders right here, they kind of look like balloons, are called pneumatocysts. They're filled with gas, which means that they float, helping our kelp fronds reach towards the sunlight. So this piece right here is called a scimitar blade, and this represents the new growth of the kelp. And Mariah, it looks a lot like the logo from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's Gander, I've got one I hidden way up here on my arm and it's somewhere on my chest. In here. Um, we have our kelp logo. There it is. That's the logo for the Monterey Bay Aquarium. 
and it's representative. It's that scimitar blade. It's that new growth. And it's to show that we're always reaching towards new goals and then striving towards new science. And we want to keep that growth and encourage new growth. Absolutely. So our kelp is such an amazing addition to this habitat. It's really the foundation of this habitat that so many different animals rely on. So our kelp is like a three-dimensional structure in the habitat. It relies on the rocky reef to hang on to the bottom, but it provides so much habitat for many animals. It's kind of like an underwater apartment building in a lot of ways. We have animals that rely on the canopy. A lot of seabirds maybe are feeding in the canopy. Fish are hiding amongst the fronds. And also we have animals that live inside of the holdfast. So you might be able to see some of them down there as well. So I actually work up in the redwoods, the tallest trees in the world up in Northern California. Shout out to my North Coast Redwoods family. And so the giant kelp forests of the sea remind me a lot of the redwoods on land. And it just is an amazing opportunity to be able to explore both of those grand places on this planet, especially today for World Ocean Day. Erica, do we have any questions from the audience you might want to pass on to us? Yeah, um, I actually had a question. It's uh, just come up on screen right now. Or no, that's about the rockfish. I did see a question come in um, from a student who is asking uh, what we're allowed to do. There we go. What kind of activities are we allowed to do in marine protected areas? So obviously you're scuba diving. So it seems like humans can go into our MPAs, right? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, it, the answer is it depends, right? So different marine protected areas have different rules. Today we're in a state marine reserve, which Erica mentioned earlier is the, the most protection in an MPA is in a reserve, meaning that humans aren't allowed to take things with them when they come, meaning we don't collect things when we come here. If Mariah and I find a really cool shell that we want to put maybe in our house, we don't take those things when we're in a reserve, right? We don't go fishing here. We don't harvest kelp from here. So everything that's here is completely protected, but this place is still open for recreation, for education, and for lots of other opportunities that are what we call non-consumptive, meaning they don't remove things from the place. And that's kind of a lot like a state park. So for those of you tuning in, our state parks are places that are protected as well, which basically means there's just certain rules on what humans can and can't do in that place in order to protect the plants, animals, the habitat, the cultural resources, and the natural resources of this place. I love that question. Thank you. Yeah, it is a really good question. And and yeah, there are variations in the types of protections that California marine protected areas uh, permit to for a lot of recreation. And some MPAs do allow for minimal fishing, but here in a state marine reserve, not allowed. So Whenever you're visiting the California coast, it's really important to know where you go, right, Angie? So whether you're diving, whether you're kayaking, if you want to go out and do beach combing, it's good to know if you're in a marine protected area or not. All right, we have one more question. It just come up on screen. How deep are you today, Angie? Yes, we knew this question was coming. Mar do you want to fill our folks in on uh, how deep we are and maybe the temperature of our water today? Sure thing. So we are not very deep. We're sitting at about 15 feet underwater today, but it is a balmy about 53 degrees. So as you can see, Angie and I are fully covered head to toe. We've got on these lovely neoprene wetsuits to keep us warm while we are underwater today because it is a little chilly. But that cold water is filled with nutrients. And that cold water and all those nutrients, they upwell from our canyon. And that is what allows our kelp forest to thrive and provide habitat and home and food to all the other animals in the kelp forest. So while it might be a little chilly for us, overall, that cold water is great for the Monterey Bay. Speaking of cold water, Mariah, I know that um, earlier Alec mentioned how there is a special species of animal called a southern sea otter that lives here in Monterey Bay. Do you want to talk about the sea otter's significance in the kelp forest ecosystem? Yeah, of 
word. So, the sea otter is a really unique and cool animal. It has the thickest fur of any marine mammal with over a million hairs per square inch. Really dense fur, that's what helps keep it warm. Now, the sea otters have really strong teeth that they can use to munch down on some pretty hard substances. First and foremost being purple sea urchins. Now you've probably seen a picture of a purple sea urchin. They look like a big old purple spiky ball. Now we get those all up and down the coast. And unfortunately their favorite thing to snack on is that whole trap that Angie showed you earlier. Now, if we get too many urchins in an area, they can eat up all those whole tasks. And it leaves what's called an urchin barren, where there's no more kelp. And that's not something that we want at all. But if we have those sea otters in the area, and they're munching on those sea urchins, they can keep the population in check, and therefore keep a balanced ecosystem. And that's why his sea otters are what we call a keystone species. And that means if we tug on them, we'll notice their effect on the rest of the ecosystem as well. That's really awesome to know about the otters and the urchins. We did just have a question come through on um, Monterey Bay Aquarium's live feed. I'm asking about the current state of kelp forests in California. We've we've spoken a little bit about how water clarity and ocean temperatures um, impact kelp. Uh, where's kelp at right now in terms of, uh, is it prolific or is it dwindling? Yeah, that's a really great, great question. And it is a large topic of um, discussion and interest right now along the California coast. Unfortunately, that is because our kelp forests are not doing as well as they historically have done. Like I mentioned, I live on the north coast of California, and instead of a giant kelp forest, we have a bull kelp forest. I know there's a few, oh, look, there's one right here behind me. That's my friend, the bull kelp. Bull kelp forest, um, specifically, which is the area that I work and dive in the most, um, are definitely uh, decreasing over time. We're having a large problem with urchin barrens. Unfortunately, we don't have sea otters up in Northern California and in much of their historic range. They were nearly hunted to extinction during um, the maritime fur trade. And that has had effects on the ecosystem as well as a lot of other issues like warming ocean temperatures, things like sea star wasting disease that are removing another predator of the sea urchin. And so in general, our kelp forests need some help. We're really lucky to have organizations uh, like partners, including the Monterey Bay Aquarium and other nonprofits along the coast of California who are working to restore kelp forests. Some of that actually includes scuba divers going underwater and doing restoration, a lot like we have on land as well. So one way that we can really support our planet and support our oceans is by supporting conservation efforts, restoration efforts to help our kelp forests, help our land forests like the redwood forests. Shout out to all my friends doing redwood restoration up on the North Coast. Um, but the same type of science has to happen and be prioritized in places uh, like kelp forests in order to keep these places strong and prolific along the, along the coast of California and beyond. That's really great to hear about those restoration projects. I know that there are a lot of studies occurring currently. Um, here in Monterey, we have the giant, giant kelp restoration project. And I know that up in um, the North Coast area, they're also doing a, a study removing urchins and seeing how the kelp comes back when urchins are removed. So that getting the science behind it is a really important way to just study what the effects are of urchin removal and then being able to witness that kelp rebound and come back. Now we do have a couple more questions coming in from our live stream. Um, we're going to do another kelp question and then we have a lot of questions about scuba diving. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the kelp questions that came in was um, how deep does, uh, does kelp grow? Is it everywhere in Monterey Bay? Ooh, good question. Mariah, do you wanna take this one? <laughs> I can try, although to be honest with you, I'm not sure what the deepest depth kelp growth that is. Um, kelp is a really unique organism in the sense that under ideal conditions, it can grow up to two feet a day. So and while it can be in deeper waters with the intent of growing up towards the sun, 
it doesn't tend to grow in really cold, really deep water because like Angie and Erica were talking about earlier, it wants the sunlight. It's a photosynthesizer. So we often find it closer to the shore, right along the shoreline. And you can see it, it's almost like a belt that goes along the California coast. And that's pretty much where it likes to grow. It doesn't get very deep, although we have seen some kelp in the Monterey Canyon, which is very, very deep. <laughs> so as far as I know, um, kelp can grow to about 200 feet tall. Like Mariah said, under ideal conditions, it can grow up to almost two feet a day. Can you imagine if humans grew that tall, we would be very, very tall. Um, so our kelp forest can, I would say that's probably like mostly where you're going to find them is within that 200 foot depth range. They do need that sunlight to survive and probably where you can find them is dependent on the water quality of the ocean. And that kind of links us back to our watershed theme for today, which is we're all responsible for making sure that the things that make their way into the ocean aren't inhibiting the growth of our kelp forests, which provides so much habitat, so much food, and so many human benefits as well. Yeah. Uh, speaking of food, I know that um, there have been some, some mentions of sustainable fishing, sustainable seafood. Um, Mariah, do you want to share a little bit about Monterey Bay Aquarium's efforts with sustainable seafood through the Seafood Watch program? Yeah, I'd be more than happy. Now, I'm actually really glad we saw that rockfish earlier because that is a great representation of how programs like the Seafood Watch program can have a positive impact on fisheries. So that rockfish is used to be part of, obviously it's protected here in Point Lobo, but would be part of a ground fish fishery. Now, we saw a drastic decline in those fisheries not long ago, but we redlisted those fish and we said, hey, these aren't really safe to eat right now. They need to bounce back. And conscious people who were hopping on our website, making those good choices when they go to the store and restaurants, really put in that effort. And they were able to bring those fish back. And we've seen the ground fish rebound. And it's phenomenal to be able to come out here and actually see rockfish as we're swimming around. Now, that can apply to other fisheries as well. If you, the consumer, are willing to take just that extra minute to make sure you're making a sustainable choice, it can make all the difference in a fishery. So I highly encourage you, please feel free to hop onto our Seafood Watch website and scope out what's on the red list, what's on the yellow list. You might be surprised by what you find. And try and make those efforts when you go to the store or when you go to a restaurant. Just ask, hey, do you sell sustainable seafood? And you know what? The pressure of that question might be enough to encourage a restaurant or a grocery store to start making those choices as well. Yeah, that's a really great reminder that we can use our voice, right? We as consumers, we hold the power of the dollar. We have that purchasing power. So we can walk into our local grocery store or market. We can walk into our favorite sushi seafood restaurant. We can go to, you know, your local place and you can say, hey, I'm looking for sustainable seafood options. You open that conversation and maybe the restauranter, maybe the manager hasn't thought about sustainable seafood, especially if you're really far from the coastline. Opening that conversation is a great way to get it started and to let people know that consumers care and consumers want to spend their money on doing what is sustainable for our global ocean. Really great reminder, Mariah. All right, we do have a few more minutes with our divers. We've got a couple more questions coming in about scuba diving. Do the divers have a couple more minutes to answer a few more questions about diving? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Oh, yeah. All right. So the first question for both of you is how long have the two of you been scuba diving? Not like cool. today, but over your lifetime. <laughs> I can jump in. Yeah, you go first. I first got certified in 2013, fresh out of high school. <laughs> and I've been diving ever since. So since 2013. <laughs> Nice. I think we're right around the same timeline. I believe I was first certified in 2014. Um, it's hard to remember exactly, but yeah, I've been diving ever since and happy to be diving with you all today. Absolutely. So that's really great that you've both had quite a few years underwater. There are a couple of people who have tuned in who have asked about 
your uh, looks like our video froze there for a second. We're working on it. Um, a couple of people have tuned in and asked about how young you are, you are how young you can be when you go to dive for your first time. You know, what's the age limit? If you're a young child or a teenager and you want to start scuba diving, how old do you have to be? And where are good places to learn how to scuba dive? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. It might depend on which certifying agency you're going with. So that, that question might be different for different things. But kids can absolutely learn how to scuba dive. I actually used to certify kids in scuba diving at a previous job that I have. And I know lots of kids that have tried it and loved it and are lifelong divers. I think, Erica, you were certified as a kid, right? Well, my first dive was kind of a sneaky one with my father, who was a dive master, and he took me down into probably what was just 10 feet of water. Um, and I did that at age 12. Um, but then I really did my certifications back when I was, I think, 21 or 22 is when I got started. So it's been uh, a good, you know, 15, 20 years <laughs> of experience the, the global ocean. But yeah, I would also say, too, with with training um, and getting kids into the water for the first time, you know, even if they're not on dive gear, getting kids comfortable in, you know, in the water, swimming lessons, getting them into snorkeling, uh, understanding water safety so that they can comfortably move around next to the water and on the surface of the water before they get into the deep end of scuba diving. Right, Angie? Yeah, definitely. We just wanted to pan the camera to show you a school of fish that we're swimming by. But yeah, absolutely for... Yeah, senoritas. Oh, there they go. We can see them. Yeah, so if any kids out there are looking to get certified, make sure you're hiring a, a reputable dive professional, a dive instructor who can take you out. Make sure you're being safe and learning all the important things you need to know. Um, but kids are absolutely welcome to join the sport of scuba diving. And uh, we love to have you all in the water. So be sure to look up some places, read the reviews, talk to some fellow ocean professionals and uh, get out there. Good reminder is it's all about the safety. Um, diving is a really accessible uh, way to experience the ocean, but you really need to know the safety before you get in and put the gear on. All right, we have another question from a student, um, Jamie Adamson. Um, she's, she's commenting for her six-year-old Sienna and Sienna wanted to know if you ever see baby otters and that could be either underwater or on the surface of the water. Do either of you ever see baby sea otters? I'll let Maria take this because I don't live in a place where sea otters live. <laughs> I'm the otter person here. <laughs> so, yes, I have seen baby sea otters. Now, underwater? No, I haven't. They tend to like to keep their distance. And that's something that we respect as divers, is that when we see marine mammals, we don't approach them. And we don't try to interact with them or change their behaviors in any way. Now, on the top of the coat, right off the back of the aquarium, you can look out and see baby sea otters all of the time. Moms and pups often float on top of the kelp, wrap up, and they hold their pups on their chest, and you can see them just floating in the kelp forest just off the coast. And we do see them pretty frequently here in the Monterey Bay, but not really underwater. Nice. Yeah, we were swimming out for our dives yesterday, and there was a sea otter just a few, like a stone's throw away from us. And I got really excited because I didn't get to see them up where I usually dive. And they're just so cute and cuddly, but we definitely want to give them their distance. Yeah. And of not course, cuddly. when you say the otter is a stone's throw away, we definitely do not throw stones at otters, right? <laughs> it was a measure of distance. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, that is a really important reminder when we're talking about the health of our ocean. Um, we got to talk about the health of the wildlife here. And though it may be really exciting to try to get a good close photo of a sea otter or a harbor seal or a sea lion, those, those animals that we tend to see closer to shore, it is really important to keep your distance and stay back. Because even your presence, even if you're not speaking, even if you're not, you know, tossing things at them, which please don't do that. <laughs> your presence can really impact their behavior. A lot of times when animals like seals and sea lions come onto shore, or even when otters are resting in the kelp up on the surface, it's important to let them have that rest. It is a really important time for them also to take care of their young. So you'll see those sea lions or seals with their little pups. So we definitely need to remember to keep our distance. And that's another important way that we can positively impact 
ocean health. All right, now we are gonna wrap up with the divers. I, ladies, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say any closing remarks before we begin to wrap up our program. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to point out that we have lots of fish swimming by us uh, this year. Last year for World Ocean Day, we didn't get any fish on camera. So I just wanted to give people a chance to see that. And my closing remark would be, everybody, please just get out there and connect with the water near you, whether it's a river, an estuary, uh, or the ocean or a lake. These places can bring us so many benefits so many feelings of peace and appreciation and just scope of how big we are on this planet, right? We're, as humans, an individual human, we're pretty small. And these places can really make the world feel big, but also remind us that we can make a difference, right? What we do in our watersheds, what we do on our own streets, where we live in our neighborhoods, makes a difference for places like this. But first and foremost, I just encourage you all for your health, and your well-being to get outdoors, get into your state parks, explore your marine protected areas, and help us make sure these places stay, stay, stay safe by being good stewards of them, knowing the rules, and just enjoy it yourself. Happy World Ocean Day. Shout out to my North Coast family, Cal Poly Humble Diving. Love you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. Mariah, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to share from the Monterey Bay Aquarium as we begin to wrap up? I sure would. Yes, thank you all so much for joining us today. Like Angie said, when you hug on one thing in nature, you find it's connected to everything else. We are all connected by our world ocean and by all of our waterways and our parks. So get out there, feel connected, and do what you can to be involved because when you share what you are passionate about and what you know with others, they want to be involved too. But thank you for joining us today so we can share what we're passionate about with you. And hopefully we've inspired you to want to conserve the ocean today. Fantastic. Well, thank okay. you divers so much. It's really good to see you guys underwater. We're so thankful to have you here and uh, to be able to connect and see the kelp forest from underneath. Um, I, we call it the kelp cathedral when the sun rays are just shining through. And, you know, they left some really good closing remarks. And I, I really want to sum it up today that regardless of where you are on planet Earth, not just here on the Californian coast, not inland in California, not just in the United States, but literally around the world, wherever you live, the ocean connects you. So besides our political, geopolitical boundaries, you know, we draw lines in the sand and government, you know, separates us in some ways. The ocean connects all of us. We are global citizens and it's our responsibility to take care of this space, whether you're living on it or you're far from it. So to recap some of the things we thought and talked about today, uh, up in our, our watershed, up high in the, the top mountains at Palomar Mountain State Park, we are talking about our water quality and erosion, talking about wildfires and the things that we can do up in those headwaters to make sure that the water that is moving through them stays healthy for all the humans and the species downstream. So we're looking at things like reducing the amount of fertilizers or pollutants that are getting into your local waterways, reducing your use of plastic in your life in general, and of course, making sure that plastic waste is recycled or gets in a waste container. So thinking about that thing when you're far inland is really important. No matter where you are too, you might have the opportunity to eat seafood. And sustainable seafood is a really great way to support ocean health because you're eating something that has been harvested in a limited amount and using tools that don't damage the local ecosystem. So that's another great way, even if you're nowhere near the sea, if you love to eat seafood, it's an awesome way to help protect our ocean. So as we move downstream and through our watershed, we visited Humboldt Redwood State Park in the South Fork of the Eel River. We learned about an invasive species there. Invasive species is a really big issue for a lot of California and different parts of the world. So if you're traveling and you like to recreate in the water like we do, think about cleaning everything that touches the water, literally all of your equipment, your boats, your waders, your boots, your hiking boots. You know, think about that cleaning, drying, making sure that it's fully dry before you go into another body of water so that you're not moving invasive species from one river or one lake to another. That's a really awesome way that you can reduce the transportation of those invasive species. So when we get down to the coastline and the estuary, 
Sorry about that, guys. We're just starting to bring the divers in here and there's lots of work happening on around me. When we get down into our estuaries, we're thinking about things that we can do to help protect those estuaries. We learned about ecosystem services. So the way that they are the nurseries for small fish and invertebrate species, they can sequester carbon. So keeping our estuaries clean, supporting local restoration projects to support the restoration of your local estuary. And of course, with all of these local places, whether you're on the coastline or inland, go out and enjoy them. That's what California State Parks is all about. We have the 280 parks. We want you to go out and enjoy these ecosystems and join us in protecting it. You know, 30 by 30, that initiative to protect our lands and our waterways and our ocean, it is nothing without your help. We need you all to take your individual actions and join us. And we all do these little ind individual actions together. We will end up having a really broad global impact. So thank you all so much for joining us for World Ocean Day. Thank you so much for in, you know, taking part in this presentation. We are so excited for you to go out and celebrate the rest of World Ocean Day. And as you take those nice, big, deep breaths of fresh air, remember every other breath you take is thank you, ocean. We all rely on healthy ocean ecosystems. Have a great day, everyone, and happy World Ocean Day. Thank you so much for tuning in.